A note on customization. So both Emacs and Vim are decently customizable. Emacs even more so. Like in Emacs we're talking about before, changing the number of spaces you have, stuff like that. These files are controlled by in your home directory. If you print out the hidden files, so you do an AL, you will notice that in your home directory you have a couple of files here. There's a Vim info file, but there's also for Emacs, there's a .emacs file. So this .emacs file essentially is the file that holds all your customizations for Emacs. Uh, mine happens to be a symbolic link to the Emacs file in Dropbox. This is how I sync my Emacs settings across all the different computers I work on. But yours would just be a normal file. I can open that in Emacs. So if I do emacs.emacs. Um, except I forgot the name Emacs-w.emacs. So this is essentially my, uh, this is my Emacs settings file. For those of you who know Lisp, it probably looks familiar. Um, you don't actually have to know Lisp without these files. What you have to be able to do is go onto Google, Google something like change the number of spaces in Emacs, or give you a block of code, and you paste it into this file. Um, you can, I mean, you can also read it, right? So I'm basically telling it that when I'm in, so this is for when I'm editing Linux code, or when I'm editing kernel code, we're gonna ignore that. When I'm in my normal C mode, uh, I can tell it by default I want tabs to be four spaces. There's the command to do that. Um, I have some stuff in here because I use LaTeX a lot. I basically tell it to highlight my spelling mistakes. You can use spell checkers inside both Emacs and them, um, so on and so forth. So this is basically turning on my spell checker, telling it how I want it to highlight my spelling mistakes, stuff like that. The number of customizations is vast. This is a small .emacs file. I mean, I actually don't have that many in there. There's people that have like 100 lines long customized by like Emacs and it's how they've been using it for the last 20 years. Then has similar things. Often when you go to someone's personal website, you may notice this with, you know, the professors that are a little bit older school, people will like post their bad Emacs file. It's like a brand of honor. It's, this is how I configure my text editor. And if you want to be cool, you can download it and configure your text editor in the same way too. Um, so it's not uncommon to get online. You can, any famous programmer out there, you can probably get online and find either their bad Emacs or about them file and that's how they can do their editor. Um, I'm not seeing a .emacs, I see a .emacs.d folder. Uh, I will look at that afterwards. On the, this, this is what may be screwed up on the VM because of the way I opened it the first time, but I can fix it quickly looking afterwards. Uh, sometimes there's no .emacs there by default either. That doesn't, you could create a .emacs and they'll start using it. So if I delete this file altogether, it doesn't break Emacs, it just starts using it. It's like having an empty file. Um, and not, there's not always a dot, so it could just be that one's never been created on there. If you created one and started putting settings in it, it would be useful. Other questions on customizing these editors? I mean, I'm not going to go into what all these customizations do, because that's what Google's for, but there, this is how you customize it. There is a dot emacs file, you put things in it, and it changes the way emacs works. So we looked at emacs and vim tonight. Uh, the other editor that a lot of people like to use, well, I mean, there's a number of them. Sublime is pretty popular right now. Uh, it's a multi-platform editor. Unlike Emacs and Vim, it's not a terminal-based editor. So Sublime always opens in a window. That's fine. I mean, obviously, you can't go and run it like when you're SSH'd into a server where you have no graphical interface. Uh, but for your day-to-day -day programming, a lot of people really like Sublime, especially those that never learned Emacs or Vim. So Sublime's worth taking a look into. Um, there's your lightweight editors, so this would be things like Pico, Nano, or Gedit. Uh, Gedit is probably the heavier weight one. Pico and Nano are super basic editors. They don't have any of these extra features, right? Like they have the ability to write, copy, paste, and save, and that's about it. Um, Pico and Nano come in handy sometimes again, like when you're on a machine that doesn't have any other editors and you just need to make some minor change to a file. That's kind of why they exist. Um, Gedit is the default editor in GNOME. It's very similar to like TextPad or something in Windows. Um, it will do actually syntax highlighting, but I don't know anyone that really codes in it a lot, although some people like it. Uh, it kind of sits in an awkward territory of, it does way more than a micro editor like Nano or Pico, but it doesn't do everything Emacs does, so it is awkwardly stuck in the middle. Um, I would recommend learning one of these editors. Uh, learn something that isn't GEDIT, right? Learn something that isn't Genie. Uh, learn a real editor. So Emacs, Vim, Sublime, you can Google around, there's other ones out there. They all have learning curves, but the sooner you get out of the way, that's an editor you can be really efficient in and use the rest of your life, right? 
We did a very small set of commands tonight. There are a lot more commands in Emacs, and they can make your life very efficient when it comes to coding. Um, as a programmer, you're going to spend a lot of time in a text editor, so it pays to really understand at least one text editor because there are times when knowing the esoteric things like we need to do find replace, stuff like that. I mean, all these editors are ways to do that. Um, knowing how to do all of that in at least one editor is just going to make you, I mean, you can't code without it, right? You're going to get bogged down manually retyping lines because you don't know how to copy and paste. So they all have learning curves, but the earlier you take the time to learn one of these editors, the more you will benefit from having invested that time. Right? It's something you can benefit for the rest of your life. Emacs has been around for 30 years. It's not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about learning it, and they're not going to support it tomorrow or something like that. Vim has been around for almost as long. Sublime's newer, but it'll probably stick it out. It's an open source project, so worst case, you can take the source code and modify it yourself if whoever's doing it now can manage it. So, uh, Emacs and Vim are also open source. Emacs is by the GNU project. Than as by somebody else. Um, so that's the bulk of what I have. Are there any last questions?